in plastic and I put them between the insoles and the running shoes and I was walking on air. <clears throat> and this is a story of what I did with some of them when I got to, to what was Leningrad then and is St. Petersburg now. That's Moscow, that's got nothing to do with this. Okay. I was walking on air. That was about what they cost me. I paid almost as much for my new footwear as the 2,000 rubles I had wrapped in plastic and hidden beneath the insoles of each shoe. Whether you refer to them as sneakers or runners would depend on whether their contents were discovered. The enormous pea green train with a single yellow stripe sat all by itself way out on platform six. Every carriage had a red and gold hammer and sickle shield on the side, emblazoned with CCCP. The squat little conductress with the Khrushchev mole squealed with delight as she examined my tickets and itinerary. Ooh, Tashkent, she bubbled. Must be special like that. She led me into a compartment with an old Finnish man who decided we should speak German. The windows were sealed shut. Exactly on time, a shutter rippled through the metal monster and back again. We started to pull out of the station, and I realized that then there was no going back. Evil empire, here I come. We rocked and then rolled through the Finnish countryside as though we were on an excursion to any other place that a train would go. I saw us cross the border without stopping. Peculiar, perhaps, but if you're the biggest kid on the block, there might be nothing much to stop for. Then, a few kilometers later, in the middle of a birch forest somewhere, we came to a sudden standstill. Nothing more happened for a good quarter of an hour, and then they came out of the taiga, like smoke. Dozens of them, with gray trench coats and two large military cap visors, boarded us, pirates on an open sea. I heard heavy boots and deep voices drawing closer, and the dissonant slam of compartment doors closing, locked from the outside corridor. It grew warm. Nothing more happened for a good quarter of an hour, and then our own compartment door slid open. You be the tvarich, passport the prejas, he said, swift and polite. We handed him our passports. He looked under our seats and over the ceiling with a stepladder. Then he locked us back in again. It grew warmer. I looked across to the old Finn. He shrugged and looked away sheepishly. We had obviously left Kansas. Captain Soviet returned in 15 minutes with our passport stamped. He started asking me questions in Russian before he realized he was wasting time. He asked to see my money. I handed him my traveler's checks, American Express. No more? He asked. No more, I said. Do you have rubles? He asked. I almost jumped out of my shoes. <laughs> rubles? <coughs> I coughed. My feet grew unbeatably hot, unbearably hot. Da, rubles, he repeated. Or diamonds, religious articles, propaganda, contraband. I was grateful for the diversification of his interest. Captain Soviet motioned for me to open serendipity. That was my knapsack. He went through it meticulously, scrutinizing everything. Here, you open, he said, handing me one of my film canisters. I opened it. Take off your shoes, he said. My world ended. <laughs> Meanwhile, the old Finn, mindful of his prostate and possibly my predicament, began berating Captain Soviet for all the small talk and demanded access to a toilet or someone would have to clean it all up. Captain Soviet shrugged and let him out. Okay, finished, he muttered, and went on to the next car. I mentally recounted my toes. There was a celebration of sorts going on in the next car. They invited me in. They were all Finnish and drunk. They told me they were going to Leningrad for women and cheap vodka. Kari threw me a can of Carlsberg. We stopped at a Beryoshka shop in Weiburg. A large painting of Lenin supervised their purchases. Six months ago, that was a picture of Brezhnev, said Kari. Back on board, they looked at my itinerary and told me that no one, but no one, would meet me at the station. I told them that would be highly unlikely. Our train pulled into the most western city of Russia, the most northerly metropolis of over a million people, and the home of the Hermitage, the largest art museum in the world. No one was there to meet me. 
I wandered aimlessly around the soldiers and the babushkas until a sweet young thing looked at my papers. She found two very KGB-looking hoods who dropped me in the back of a black 1960s vintage Cheka limousine. It looked like the push-button Valiant I'd bought for a buck from my cousin, but it was black and chauffeured. They drove me to the Astoria Hotel. I left... It didn't look like that then. <laughs> I left them with the bell staff and approached the registration desk. I had read about the Astoria. When it was built in 1911, it had innovations like central heating, in-suite running hot and cold running water, Art Nouveau facades, splendid salons, a classic ballroom, and glass ceiling winter garden restaurant with dumb waiters and custom-built refrigerator in the kitchen. Hitler had planned to hold his victory party here. He was a bit premature, but I arrived right on time. They ushered me upstairs to a palatial pre-revolutionary gold brocade suite. I climbed into the closet and withdrew 2,000 rubles from my sneakers, worth about $3,000 in the official Soviet exchange rate. I went back downstairs to make a dinner reservation. I approached the intern's desk in the lobby. She knew who I was. Yes, Mr. Winkler, what can I help you with, she said. I already knew the answer. I'd like to go to the Café Metropole, I said. The blood drained from her face. We generally discourage going to this restaurant, she offered. That is one of the reasons I would like to have dinner there, I replied. I had heard about the Café Metropole. It had everything I wanted. It is not a good idea, she insisted. I inquired as to why. There are certain undesirable influences that may be sometimes found in such a place. Her brow furrowed. I insisted. She picked up the phone. I cut a flurry of formality, and then some. Da, Udin Tourist, Winkler, da, da, niet. It was done. I thanked her and got up to leave. Excuse me, Dr. Winkler, she said, but do you have rubles? My head turned back, smiling. I marched down Nevsky Prospect like Napoleon had wanted to. Dostoevsky would have been proud. In those days, there was almost no vehicular traffic. You would have been forgiven for missing it. There was no sign on the door, but when I put my hand to it, I could feel the heat and vibrations of the inferno on the other side. A slap slid back. Da, said the eye on the other side. Udin Turis to tell story of Winkler, I said. Open sesame. And it did, unleashing the tension of the evil spirits within. The wave of noise and smoke and hormones bowled me over. My first view was of two waiters in a fist fight. It took seven Marlboros for me to get to my table. The band was playing rock around the clock better than Bill Haley ever did. No sooner was I seated, than company arrived. Natasha and Nikita dropped in my parachute, their two chairs pulled out in unison by chivalrous penguins. Two bottles of champagne at ten rubles a magnum hit the table running. The meal was splendid. Lamb appetizer with prunes, carrots, sauerkraut, and pickles, chicken keeve, a nice dry white wine, ice cream, and coffee. After cognac was poured and consumed, more was poured. It was becoming clear that whatever Natasha and Nikita want, wanted, Natasha and Nikita got. Natasha and Nikita wanted dancing. We danced till the end of time, and that came immediately after we sat down to catch our breaths. Two Mongolian black marketeers with sunglasses and almost identical mouths of gleaming gold teeth rolled up their arms to show us the Rolexes for sale. We made room for them and their friends. They lit up strange cigarettes, more cardboard tube than tobacco. The vodka and music and musk kept coming until I just had to go. There were kisses and hugs from my generous hospitality and heartfelt sad animation at my departure. I held up two fingers on Nevsky. Some moonlighter drove me back to the Astoria. The desk clerk asked me where I'd been. Cafe Metropole, I offered. His eyes widened. What did it cost you? He asked. About three dollars, I said, and change. <laughs> so this is the Hotel Astoria today. It was built by the British in 1911-12.
And you have to ask why they call it the Hotel Asteria, right? Well, John Jacob Astor, who was the fur baron who made, the, made a fortune on it, was the richest man in the world at one time. Uh, and uh, his name is on the Waldorf Astoria in New York, and Astoria, Oregon, that's him. This is Nevsky Prospect. Uh, this was in 1981 when I was there, and it looks a whole lot different now. Okay. <clears throat> this one's for Ray. Uh, so, it's kind of complicated, but 